Hello and welcome to a special edition of Video Focus. Today we're going to talk about this year's 50th anniversary of the cable television industry and share comments from employees about what they've seen and done to help the industry become what it is today. I'd also like to point out that this year also marks the 15th anniversary for the National Division. After 50 years, we've come to take cable television for granted. Children today have no concept of a world with only three or four channels or how to use rabbit ears to tune them in. When I was in high school, my family had an antenna receiver installed on the roof that gave us HBO only. And in college, groups of people would reserve the TV room in dormitories to watch music videos on this new cable network called MTV. But to many folks, that's all just recent history. So how did it all begin? There's some dispute as to who and where, but all agree cable television started in 1948. On one coast, a man named Ed Parsons of Astoria, Oregon, was looking to find a way to use the television set his wife had insisted he buy. On the other side of the country, John Walson was in Pennsylvania, looking for a way to sell more television sets at his electronics store. In both cases, the communities were located among hills and valleys, so that regular rooftop antennas were only marginally helpful, if at all. But cable brought programs from nearby metropolitan areas right into their homes with a crystal clear picture. And once the public had a glimpse of what Parsons and Walson were doing, the rush was on. People were banging down doors to have wires strung to their homes so that they could watch television too. Of course, at that time, it was all broadcast, but it was a hit. In just 10 years, the number of television sets in American homes grew from less than a million in 1948 to more than 42 million in 1958. Well, I was discharged from the Marine Corps in 1952 in July, and I went to work for Wingsport Cable in uh, August 1952. Well, we were bringing three channels in uh, distance. We brought two channels from Philadelphia, channel 3 and 6, and we brought in Altoona, channel 10. And I brought the three networks in into Williamsport. And Williamsport is a community in a valley. There's mountains all the way around it, and they couldn't receive anything off air. So the, uh, they had very little competition for service uh, from uh, in, in, uh, broadcasters. Uh, one thing that lets you know about Williamsport, Pennsylvania, though, is one of the few communities where there were three cable companies on the same poles. So there was lots of competition within cable co uh, systems. So our time today with satellite services and MMDS and everything with competition, we had really tough competition back in those days. And the visionaries who started wiring the small communities were realizing that they could charge people a monthly fee for cable television, along with the fee for wiring and installation. And then cable systems became hot properties. Men like Bill Daniels and Bob Magnus built their reputations during that time, as well as their corporations that still stand today. It was really exciting because uh, it was a 12-channel system. And uh, I can remember one time, uh, we were working on a street, we had our work orders, and we, we typically worked from sunup till sundown. Everybody would just come out as soon as they'd see the cable truck and say, do you have my work order? Everybody wanted connected. This one afternoon, though, there was a local bar in East Deer Township, and the, the bar owner came out and said, you have my order. We didn't have his order. He said, well, there was a, a game on, some, some game, I don't know what it was, but he said, I gotta have it tonight. And of course, he came over and corralled all of us in stars. There was about four of us there. He said, now, put his arms around us right by the truck. And he said, if you guys get this bar connected today, I'm going to take care of you. So that was a memorable moment that night. We got the bar connected, needless to say. And uh, to give you an idea of how the night went, he, the bartender started out with the first channel. And he said, there's channel two. Give everybody a drink on channel two. Then he went to channel three. And he did the same thing. When he got up to about channel six, we said, could we have a hamburger on channel seven instead of more drinks? So uh, he was really excited. And there was that kind of excitement then that was almost uh, frenzy. Well, I think every day was a challenge because we were the first uh, to get into the business. And there was nobody that could give you any training. 
and you learn by experience from just about everything you did. And anything that uh, uh, that was new is usually something created by the individuals at the system themselves. And of course, everything was up in a mountain back in those days, and you couldn't get access by vehicle or everything. You had to walk up, and when you get up there and pull in cable and everything, we used uh, mules to pull cable and haul ca uh, hardware and stuff and b brick and water and everything up to build the buildings and so forth. Built towers up on the mountains, uh, hauling stuff up with a uh, mule. We had another instance where we had a river crossing, uh, about 1,500 foot crossing, and we put a 90 foot pole on each side of the river and brought a a 5 8 inch uh, steel cable across for su su support. And of course, back in those days, the aluminum cable you uh, bought was only 1,000 foot lengths. So where does the splice fall? In the middle of the river. And of course, back in those days, coax cable isn't, wasn't built like it is today. And for cold weather, you get center conductors that shrink back. In cold weather, you'd have an outage and, and end up having to go out uh, climb the 90-foot pole, get a cable buggy put over on the strand, crawl out of that strand, the cable buggy, and ride it out to the middle of the river and fix the splice, and then the technician will pull you back in. It was about 20 years later, in June of 1968, that American Television and Communications Corporation was created. ATC was the start of what we all know now as Time Warner Cable. At the start, ATC had just 216 employees, responsible for 36 cable systems in 14 states. There were close to 121,000 passings and just under 68,000 customers. The company was run by President Monroe Monty Rifkin. A typical cable system had between 5 and 12 channels, charging around $5 a month. Seven current national division systems were acquired in that first year, including Chanute, Emporia, Independence, Neodiche, and Parsons, Kansas, as well as Chillicothe and Marshall, Missouri. And those systems had an auspicious start, as you can well see from these ads, for the grand opening of the Parsons, Kansas cable system in 1966. That system was launched in January with plenty of fanfare, including a visit from Miss America, Debbie Bryant. Her mother, Irene, also made the trip. You'll note in this era before enlightenment, the caption for Irene Bryant also includes the woman's measurements. Of course, the ads and photos from this special newspaper supplement also shared the measurements of the cable system, including the fact that they used seven miles of cable and spent approximately $250,000. And obviously, no expense was spared in this 11-channel marvel of the time. How's this for a very early edition of the Weather Channel? If you're a fan of A&E, look closely and you might recognize a newsman from Topeka who now hosts investigative reports and other A&E documentary series, Bill Curtis. And as I said earlier, this was just one of the systems that ATC owned when it started in 1968. It was an exciting time, but what seems so minor today in terms of technology and growth was monumental in ATC's early days. Uh, and of course we had, when there was nothing planned, we had the old camera that went over the big dials and it would swing by and occasionally we'd put something special in there, some flowers or something for people to watch besides the dials. Um, that weather channel though actually was extremely popular. Uh, a lot of folks in cable kid about it, but it was extremely popular because when the camera went on the dial, that dial they knew was that temperature right there in downtown New Kensington where that cable system was because that's where the instruments were, okay? And uh, people really liked that. They relied on that more so than the temperature they get from a Pittsburgh TV station, which was 17 miles away. So it, it really was very popular, too, the old camera going across the dials. We uh, created our own weather channel, uh, local announcement channel, on one of the channels. And then also we put uh, local origination, an uh, evening news forecast on every night. Uh, and uh, our manager had drove 15 miles up to the top of the mountain and had a, a camera and everything set up. He could operate the camera and everything, a one-man set up, and he would go on the air every evening. 
wintertime was kind of rough. Sometimes you get snowed in because of, of the snow drifts and everything there. When I, when I started with the company doing some uh, planning and designing 20 years ago out of my 26, this was my tool that I have, slide rule, the calculator and a pencil. And uh, from 120 miles of plan that we have at that time, we are up to 580, uh, close to 600 miles. The period of time that I got in was, you know, in the mid to late 60s, uh, coaxial, aluminum sheath coaxial cable and flexible drop wire was pretty much the, the standard. Now, um, lots of problems with it. I mean, styrene cables, uh, lots of folks in the in cable industry who have been in it for a while have experienced the problems with styrene cables, which we had. And these were cables that actually they use styrofoam as a dielectric. And the styrofoam, as you can imagine, is just like the styrofoam you're familiar with that's in packing. And, you know, you smash it down and it just stays and it crumples all up. And, and what it would do is if there'd be a little break in the cable anywhere, it would just get water in there and it would travel down the styrofoam. And it could travel literally for a mile and contaminate the entire cable. I mean, people used to take the cables and shake them to try and get the water out. There were some real challenges back then with some of the products that we worked with. The 12-channel transistor amplifiers, which were the uh, uh, amplifiers that followed the tube amplifiers. Uh, tube amplifiers, of course, were a real challenge. I never personally worked with any of those, but you can imagine the changing of the tubes. The transistor amplifiers, when they came out, they were sort of revolutionary. Um, they, they, they ran, uh, you know, low power consumption. Uh, they ran a lot cooler. Uh, they, they were lighter, smaller, easier to splice in. Uh, they ran off of 30 volts AC, so they, were, they, were, they weren't power hungry. Um, and they were state of the art. Uh, and and they, had, they had their problems with, uh, you know, we had 35 amp cascades and we had problems maintaining levels back then. Everybody did that was building cable plant. Um, but, but short of that, all in all, the equipment worked pretty well. Most of every improvement we did on the equipment, we did ourselves. I mean, it wasn't where, like today, you can rely on a, a vendor to uh, send something to and say, analyze this for me and, and tell me what we can do. And they'll come up with maybe an upgrade kit or they'll redesign it. Whereas today, we, we did the redesigning. Well, we were on the bench. We were tearing it apart. We were putting in different transistors, different heat sinks, redesigning the biasing of the transistors. And so we were trying to actually make the product better than the manufacturer had originally uh, you know, built it to work. ATC was a leader in the industry right from the start. In March of 1972, the company announced the first installation of two-way capable cable in Orlando, Florida. And by December of 1975, ATC had a half a million customers from 99 operating systems or franchises in 30 states. That's roughly the size of the national division right now. At around this same time in 1972, Gerald Levin, a name you should recognize as the current chairman of Time Warner, and Charles Dolan launched the nation's first pay TV network, Home Box Office. This marks a significant point in the cable industry as a national satellite distribution system was developed, opening the door to an explosive growth of program networks. The second service to use satellite for transmission was a local television station in Atlanta owned by Ted Turner, WTBS. Uh, De Leon, you remember when uh we started installing HBO, and they were making the dish outside. Yeah, that was in 1975 when we started with the HBO. And uh, we were the fourth city in the nation to have HBO. Is that correct? That's right. And uh, tell us about when you started with your service calls. You were servicing at 4,000 customers. Yes, that was a four time. I mean, four thousand customers, and uh, we had about not too many service calls on the every day. And uh, and now you're up to how many? Yes, uh, on the well, we're not right now. We got uh, thirty-five uh, thousand customers. Vivo Company, our company name at the time, had a reception at the Posada Hotel to turn on the HBO switch. Laredo was the fourth city in the country to offer HBO on their lineup. Our lineup consisted of 13 channels and now HBO. At this reception, uh, there was a young man uh, representing HBO 
uh, an upcoming young man in the cable industry by the name of Jerry Levine. I wonder whatever happened to him. <laughs> Just joking. <laughs> Uh, shortly after that, HBO carried the now legendary Thriller in Manila. And Ed Davidson, our general manager at the time, decided to place several TVs outside in the parking lot, in the coffee shop, in the, our small lobby, and employees could invite friends and family to view the bout. Um, we were almost mobbed that night with so many people. Uh, little did we know that we were watching boxing history in the making. Late in 1977, ATC announced a merger with media conglomerate Time Incorporated. The deal wasn't actually finalized until November of 1978. But one year after that, in 1979, ATC hosted a celebration to mark reaching one million customers. In fact, at that time, Former Colorado Senator Gary Hart commended ATC's achievement in an address to the Senate. Times have certainly changed. November of 1980 was when this picture was taken to mark the groundbreaking of ATC's corporate office in Denver, which still houses part of the company's corporate departments. In this picture, those of you who've been with the company a while might recognize Trig Mirren, Henry Gerken, and June Travis just behind Mr. Rifkin. Mirren would actually become president of ATC. Gherkin was chief counsel, and Travis was a senior vice president, now with the NCTA. In the late 70s and early 1980s, throughout the cable industry, the concept of narrowcasting, or offering television networks targeted to specific interest groups, sparked the birth of new networks. Entertainment and Sports Programming Network, or ESPN, Cable News Network, Showtime, USA, BET, MTV, Nickelodeon, Madison Square Garden, and the Christian Broadcasting Network were among the first wave. In the mid-80s, a second wave of new networks hit the scene, including the Disney Channel, Lifetime, Discovery, Financial News Network, The Weather Channel, A&E, The Nashville Network, AMC, Home Shopping, Regional Sports Networks, and Pay-Per-View. ATC and the cable industry were enjoying unheard of growth and popularity among customers and legislators and a continuing world of possibilities for the future. I started in 1978, um, was hired by Trig Murin and Chip Morris as manager of pay TV at the old ATC. The cable systems in those days, it seems like it was just 20 years ago, but in those days, um, had probably nine or ten, as many as 12 channels and they were all duplicated broadcast and some LO. So when we brought in HBO, it, well, oh, by the way, I might want, to, might want to mention that basic at that time was like six ninety-five. So we would bring in HBO and double their workload. So, and they had folios. I mean, we were working from just paper records uh, and postcard billing, uh, things like that. So what we were doing was actually doubling the workload by adding one channel. So for them, it was a quite a, an interesting change. Uh, and just to give you an idea, we would go in and in a cable system over a 10-day free preview and in less than 30 days connect 25% of all the homes in that community to HBO. And we were charging $7.95, $8.95 a month. So even more than the cost of the rest of cable. Um, so it was really interesting. It changed the billing system. It changed just how they did business in the cable system. Okay, when I first came on, many, maybe most of our uh, cable systems were doing their billing, all their accounts receivable on handwritten cards and sending out coupon books like you would have for your car payments uh, to the customers. I guess customers didn't move around as much then. <laughs> when we first did budgets both at ATC and then in the decentralized environment. They were still hand done, you know, and it was a, a big package about that fat. And every time you changed one number, you had to race holes all the way through the paper. Uh, so being able to have your, com your budgets on a computer disk has just been amazing. And in the early years, the systems didn't have computers, so they would still turn their budgets in by hand and we would input on the disks and gradually we've gotten uh, over to the 
to the systems being able to do it. And the, the biggest thing I remember, the, the, I guess the, you might say the um, shock that I had in relocating from a system into the corporate office was the fact that about half the time in engineering was spent running down PAs. I mean, we actually did engineering about half the time, and the other half the time we were looking for PAs because the people in the systems were trying to get plant built. The, the corporate office hadn't really moved quick enough to recognize what had to be done in order to get all these cable plants built out there and built in an efficient manner. And they were still operating on a we got to conserve capital and watch every dollar, you know, kind of mode, which was good for the time that uh, industry was in its infancy, but now that it had kind of opened up, uh, in order to get these uh, tough franchise deadlines met on all these new builds that we had, you really needed a different process. We wound up trying to expedite that process as engineers, and we're down there looking for PAs constantly, and they'd be sitting on people's desks up in the division managers, or they'd be on Jimmy Doolittle's desk, and uh, it's kind of funny to think that you're hired as an engineer and you wind up in a really clerical role, okay? Things were organizationally pretty stacked up. Uh, I think a general manager of a cable system needed seven approvals within the company on the project authorization form in order to build a $50,000 plant extension. By the time it sort of wound its way through all that process, the system had normally completed the project anyway. In 1982, the company came to the realization that now that they've got all of these new, thousands of miles of additional cable plant, that, uh, and, and a lot of it was based on optional services, that they were going to have to focus more on operating cable systems well and selling more. And that's when the company did a pretty radical departure uh, beginning at the end of 1982. Uh, they started a decentralization process. In the spring of 1984 is when ATC's strategy to decentralize management of all its divisions led to the creation of the National Division. The division was a conglomeration of systems that didn't exactly fit into any of the other major metropolitan area divisions. It was just the start of something special. Woodward, Oklahoma was one of our systems and every year uh, we, we, they, a request came in to replace a lot of cable there. And it cost a lot of money and of course the questions were always, well, why, you know, what's going on there? And we kept hearing. Well, there are these gophers, and they chew through the cable, and they make a big mess of it. And, uh, oh yeah, sure, you know, nobody would believe it. Finally, someone brought in, I don't know whether it was, it was one of our engineers, said, we're having a budget meeting, they're explaining this. <laughs> and he brings a taxidermied gopher and sets it on the middle of the table. He's very flea-bitten, and I think there's a little piece of cable at his feet, and he has big teeth, you know, and so. This was it. We never argued again. I mean, it was the most... Uh, persuasive argument we ever had. That was, that was a good one. So. <laughs> At the time it was founded, we were probably around the 10th largest cable company in the United States just by ourselves, and we're still in the top 20. Uh, <clears throat> so um, we have a lot of variety here. We can try new things in some places, and um, it's, uh, I, I think we're still carrying forward with the original founding spirit. I think the National Division has been a leader in our company in terms of uh, providing opportunity both for women and for minorities. And um, I, I credit Tom Rackaby very much with the leadership and the vision to do that. While regulation of the cable industry may seem like something that has only come about recently, you might be surprised to know that the Federal Communications Commission has been regulating cable television either indirectly or directly since the late 1940s. Congress has also had a hand in directing the business from as early as 1957. The first comprehensive legislation was passed in 1984, the Cable Communications Policy Act, and again in 1992, this time over a presidential veto, the Cable Consumer Protection Act added to the regulatory provisions to which we must comply. But even with restrictions and regulations, the cable industry has continued to thrive and grow, 
especially in the area of technology. And Time Warner has been in the front of the pack with several advancements, such as the full service network in Orlando and the constantly growing Roadrunner high speed data service. I think here in the near future, you're going to see it start seeing a lot of digital services uh, being put on the cable system. And of course, a lot of our system that we've upgraded to uh, uh, 750 will have the capability to add digital above 550 on this programming. Uh, I think uh, one of our challenges is going to be here, though, when digital comes out for our smaller systems and national, is that we're building a lot of 550 plant. And if you look at our channel lineups right today, we've almost filled up the entire dial to 78 channels. And the thing is, how do we deal with providing, uh, beating competition for satellites and MMDS and so forth, and being able to add additional channels on these upgraded 550 plants? I know that there's been a lot of comparison about cable and telephone. And we laugh because the telephone companies have a hundred marketing person, the people in their departments where we have one or two. <laughs> and we think that's overkill, and it is overkill. But I do think in the future we're going to come somewhere in between. They can't be competitive with the kind of overhead that they have, but we can't be competitive with the real string down, you know, streamlined version that we have too. So we're going to have to invest more in people and in, in programs. So I really believe that the next big thing you see will be the people saying, indicating, look, this is what we need. We really want this. As opposed to, hey, let me show you some toys we have, and why don't you pick one? You might like it. I'd put my money on internet. I still think internet is um, underestimated as to where it's going to go. Even with the wildest growth uh, estimates that you look at, uh, it's just too many people getting entrenched in it, too many young people growing up with a computer to where you're going to have generations that have never worked without a computer. It's not going to be that long you're going to have generation that never worked without the internet, right? And so those people are going to drive markets as they get older and they become consumers. Uh, they're really going to start driving this market. We're in a mode where we've done a lot of plant upgrades the last three or four years. We've got some more coming for the systems that haven't been upgraded. But that's not an unlimited amount of bandwidth, and we're still going to have to make our choices. Uh, some of the newer technologies, uh, you know, really what you could say about digital uh, product over cable right now is there's a lot of pioneering going on. If something makes sense for our systems, we may choose to be pioneers. Otherwise, um, we are all going to benefit from those that do. Uh, same with high-speed data. There's a strong customer de demand. We'd all like to be doing it tomorrow. The important thing is, is we add new choices for our customers, whether it's one more channel in an NPT or something completely different like high-speed data. We have to do it right when we launch it. What does the future hold for cable television? If you can imagine it, it's possible. Maybe not today or next year, but the future is limitless. Congratulations to you for choosing to be a part of it all. Happy anniversary to the cable industry. May we all reap the rewards of another 50 years of cable television. I hope you enjoyed this special edition of Video Focus. We had more video than we could use, so I'm hoping to encourage more of you to share your memories so that we can put together more segments about the history of cable for future shows. Just call me at National if you're interested. For Video Focus, this is Michelle Robertus. Thanks for watching. Between us and the two people that are on vacation, we represent about 275 years experience combined. So that's a lot of knowledge and a lot of progress that has been made.